And this is some spring migration of birds from Cuba to the United States. And you see uh, that we've got in the 5 to 10, and then up to 20, and in the center, near this rate, the WSI radiate at Key West, we see as much as uh, 20 dBZ of uh, clutter, excuse me, of bird migration. And this data was collected on April 28, 2002, uh, from 1 to 3 a.m. And if you can see down here, it cycles through the time. Uh, this, this particular, the data overall was collected between 1 to 3 a.m., but this co particular data was collected from about 5 to 7 a.m., uh, universal coordinated time. That would be GMT, Brit British time. But it's over a couple of hour period. And this two hours of data is compressed into a three second loop. And when you do that and you look at the ranges, here's uh, Key West, Key Largo, Miami, you'll see that this has the velocities of the migration. Is about, that's what you'd expect of birds. And again, I, I add as an exercise, uh, see what um, radar cross-section this corresponds to, and you'll be very surprised at the size of it. And noting again that this is a DBZ. Now let's look at the cross-section of birds. Uh, in the, the early 19, in the late, excuse me, in the late 1960s, people got really interested in characterizing the cross-section of birds. In um, East, Eastwood's book, um, they actually took a bird and they sort of like nailed it <laughs> to a, one end of it to the other onto a thin non-conducting pole and rotated it to measure its cross-section. Seems to be rather uh, in, in uh, not very reasonable for the poor bird. Uh, to, to, to get the idea of the size of birds that radars would see. But down at Wallops Island, there's a fantastic facility where uh, Conrad Hicks and Dobson's of Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory very accurately measured the radar cross-section of single birds and the radar cross-section fluctuation properties. And those bird RCSs fit the log normal distribution very well. And if you remember back from talking about cross-sections and detection, like the Weibel distribution, it's a two-parameter model that fits data with long tails. And we see here for a sparrow the fluctuations of the birds cross-section. It's wing beat in minutes. It must have been gliding a fair amount. Of the cross, but this is what the cross section, and see it's averaging for a single bird, a single sparrow, about 10 to the minus 3 meters squared. Now, I'll explain to you how they actually did it with these three different wavelengths. This is just the SBN data, and you can look up, I actually have the actual papers, uh, not Xeroxes or Xeroxes, but you can find them out around if you hit the webs and good research libraries. Um, what they would do is they would take up in an airplane a sparrow and they take it up to 10,000 feet and they put these tracking radars tracking the airplane. And then what they do is when the airplane was in track, they'd look at the amplitude as a function of time and they see a big bump as they're tracking the but the, the antenna is moving, you know, right on track with the aircraft, and then they'll let the bird out. And the bird, of course, goes from going, you know, hundreds of miles an hour to, to its own speed, and then it settles down. This is when it settles down. And then what, what they do is they see a little tiny, uh, a little, little tiny target. Uh, come off the back of the aircraft and they'll, they'll track that tiny little target and this is what they found with the S-band radar at um, at Wallops and so th these are really good well these are well calibrated calibrated radar radars and, and they were used to collect this kind of data and this is only one graph 
So we, it, this is to say, we really know the cross-section of an individual bird. And for and they did it for, for uh, many different sets, not just the sparrow, but the grackle, male and female. And uh, interesting, at UHF, the male is bigger than the female. <laughs> and uh, pigeons. And this is also from Conrad et al.'s reference. And so that's the, uh, the, uh, the average cross-section. Now, the distribution of radar bird cross-sections, this is taken from Eastwood, when they just looked at the number of detections as a function of the cross-section, and they looked up with a calibrated radar, they see uh, what looks like a normal distribution, but lo and behold, down here, it's logarithmic. So it clearly says that for you to just point up, birds are log normally distributed. And the, and the thing to note is even though we had a single sparrow at 10 to the minus 3 cross-section, a small part of the time, we, we would get cross-sections that, that were 1 square meter or even up, up near 10. So it turns out the, over, the, the distribution of bird cross-sections overlaps the distribution of small single-edge aircraft. And that is a hard problem when you have a lot of b migrating birds of separating one from the other because they actually have the same Doppler velocity. Distribution. You get rid of most of them, but not all of them. But when they're migrating an awful lot. And these are using the log, log normal cross-section model. Here is some mean cross-sections and standard deviations of the, of the log of the cross-section for birds at these different frequencies. And these are the normal sized birds that we've been talking about. And there's a wavelength dependence and the statistical fluctuation of the cross-section. This is all adapted from an excellent paper that Jerry Pollan uh, did in conjunction with research to develop good models that could be used in the development of counter-battery radars. And it's been a, a, a first-rate uh, reference in the, in the journals. It's, it was, it's in the uh, IEEE's Aerospace and Electronic Systems Society around the 19, early 1970s. Okay, so now let's move on to bird velocity and Doppler distributions. Now, here is the, uh, the, the probability density of radio velocity for L-band and X-band of birds. And this is measured data from two different radars. And you can see, it turns out these are uh, just birds that were around. They're not migrating. And if you look at, and if you randomly point the velocity vector, of a bird, you'll end up with this kind of a peak up and then down if you want. If you look at the radio, the radio portion of that velocity from a given location. And lastly, uh, let's look at the effect of birds on radar: the sensitivity, time control. This is this shows you why birds are an issue for radars. Now, this is the detection curve for an airport surveillance radar. It can see uh, a one meter square target out at 60 miles, about here. And then if I say, okay, uh, if I can have that detection at 60 miles, because of the one over R to the fourth uh, sensitivity of the radar equation, then I ought to be able to detect uh, much smaller targets and in shorter ranges. And, uh, and for this particular curve, it, you, you can detect a 10 to the minus 1 square meter target at 70 kilometers, right here, a 10 to the minus 2 meter squared target at 70 kilometers or a 10 to the minus 3 target at 70 kilometers. Now, 
this curve is for an ASR. For the, to get these curves, you'd have to add in power and in aperture an extra 10 dB. So you'd, to, to, in order to see something at 10 to the minus 3 meters squared at 70 kilometers, you'd have to have a much more powerful radar. And, and this is where the bird cross sections typically are. This is where insects are. And this is where clear air turbulence is. So for an airport surveillance radar, you're going to see 30 kilometers and less lots of birds. If I made the radar more powerful so that I could see even smaller air breathing objects, say 10 to the minus 2, you're going to see birds out at much further ranges, say 50 kilometers. And even, uh, and, and insects come into play also, you'd be able to see. So this shows you why birds are an, an I issue for radars. And since airport surveillance radars want to see, how do you handle that problem? And that's why we introduced a technique called sensitivity time control. An aircraft at 200 nautical miles, say it has a cross section of one meter squared. Because of the R to the fourth dependence, one over R to the fourth dependence and, and the linear cross section dependence of the signal to noise ratio, which is in essence the detectability, a bird at 90 nautical miles will be detected if it's got a cross-section of 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3. So if you can see a 1 meter squared target out to 200 nautical miles, you'll see birds out at 90 miles. So birds can be a significant uh, factor, but you can mitigate this false target problem if you attenuate the received signal by a factor which varies as 1 over r to the fourth. And this can be accomplished by in, in, injecting uh, noise which goes as 1 over r to the fourth into the receive channel. And the radars that utilize range ambiguous waveforms cannot use sensitivity time control because the long range targets which will alias down in range would be adversely attenuated by the sensitivity time control. And we'll get into this ambiguous range issue. I'm bringing it up this for the first time. We'll be talking about that when we do Doppler processing and uh, low, medium, and high pulse repetition rates. For these waveforms, and other techniques are used to mitigate false target problem due to birds. Now, this is the output of an air traffic control radar's tracker system. Um, and these are beacon-only data, which you can assume uh, it's the, like the last 10 targets it shows you. Click again so you see it. The, uh, the radar and the beacon are correlated with this data. And these uncorrelated targets, which are most of the stuff here, are, are birds. And this is an example of extreme uh, bird uh, clutter coming through the tracker of an ASR-9. So even today, birds can be, a, it is probably the worst time in the year that Dallas had that problem. But they can always, of course, go to beacon-only tracking. And now to summarize bird clutter issues. Birds are actually moving point targets. The velocity usually is less than 60 knots. The mean radar cross section is small, but a fraction of a bird's return fluctuates up and down and, and can, can appear to be aircraft like. And the cross section is resonant at S and L band, where a lot of uh, radars that detect the aircraft are. And bird densities can vary by quite a lot, and at times can be as much as 100 a 10 to 100 to 1,000 birds per square mile. And birds can cause significant uh, false target problems for many radars. And these significant problems uh, you have to deal with to detect targets with low cross sections, uh, like counter battery radars or targets whose cross sections has been made deliberately small. Now for insects, the last, um,
Insects can also cause false detections with very sensitive radars. The density of insects can be many orders of magnitude greater than birds, and their flight path generally follows the wind. And the, you can read the rest. The, the cross section is represented by a, a drop of water, the same mass. And the, the bird echoes, or the, excuse me, the insect echoes broadside are 10 to 1,000 times uh, that when viewed. Now here's an interesting uh, time compressed display using the WSR 88 at um, La Crosse, Wisconsin of uh, an insect hatching and breeding. In that area, La Crosse, Wisconsin along the Mississippi River is the breeding ground of the mayfly population of the world. Tens of billions of them hatch uh, live and die over a day and a half period each year in late June and early July. Here's an actual uh, photograph of one mayfly, very, very tiny. But you can see when you take tens of billions of them that they can really form a significant radar clutter for a, uh, air traffic control radar or radars in the vicinity that are looking at small objects. In summary, a number of different types of radar clutter returns have been described. Ground, sea, from the rain, birds and insects. These environmental and man-made phenomena will produce a variety of discrete and diffuse moving and stationary false targets unless they are dealt with effectively. And there are a number of signal and processing, data processing techniques that can be used to suppress these radar clutter returns. One has to be very, very careful of their effects because even though they may seem small or the tails of the distributions may seem what might bother a radar signal processor or data processor, they can be clearly, uh, as we'll see later on, a big, big effect in false loss. Here are the references for this sec uh, lecture are basic ones plus these are the specific ones I've used for uh, the the bird uh, things for paper from Jerry Pollen, Eastwood's book, uh, uh, there was a review sec uh, proceedings of the IEEE had uh, two great papers in it in 85 on bird and insects, Barry Billingsley's uh, ground clutter measurements book and a classic paper by Conrad and and all that appeared in science in 68, with a lot of other papers in that same time frame. And here, along with the problems I mentioned earlier in the uh, lecture, uh, here are the problems of Skolnick that you should do to make sure you know the material. And that brings to a close Lecture 10.